Hi, thank you for streaming one of our latest messages here at Mountain Lake Church. We hope you enjoyed the message. Please come back again very, very soon. We know that life change stories happen. They happen every day. And at Mountain Lake Church, we want to hear about your life change story. If you'd like to share your story, please visit us at mountainlake.tv and click on the story button. You can also find service locations as well as times. And if you can't come to see us in person, please know that we stream our services every Sunday at 9, 10, 30, and noon. We look forward to seeing you this weekend. So today we are continuing our series, an open letter, a study through the book of Galatians. It's kind of like this open letter. Paul realized there are some issues that were happening in this early church, one of the very first Christian churches. And when we kind of pick it apart, we're gonna see that there's a lot of similar struggles that we have here in the Bible Belt, where there's every different kind of church imaginable. You got churches that like to dance, churches that like to be the frozen chosen, churches that like to swing from the chandeliers, churches that love hymns, churches that love rock and roll, churches with pastors in skinny jeans, churches with pastors in suits. And what happens is, based on stylistic preferences, we are more divided as a Christian nation than ever before. We're more known by our way of praising Jesus than we are being known for just Jesus himself. That's not okay. So today's talk is looking at the division that was happening in the church of Galatia. And we're gonna see how we, as Christ followers, can experience freedom from division. The way we experience freedom from division is freedom from religion. See, if you think Christianity is a religion, you got the wrong understanding because somebody a lot smarter than me framed it up like this. Religion is man's attempt to reach God. Christianity, Jesus is God's attempt to reach man. And what happens a lot, the more spiritual we get, the more Bible verses we memorize, the more mission trips we've gone on, all which are great things. And I try to do as often as I can, but we start patting ourselves on the back. We end up developing the superiority complex. Paul, the author of Galatians, frames it up like this in another book. He says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. We can become the most knowledgeable church around and still be totally unaffected in shining the light in the darkness. Knowledge doesn't change people. Love is what changes people. And religion has nothing to do with love. Religion is a system of doing things, trying to earn the favor and the love of God. As children of God, all we've got to do is say yes and accept it and then try to show other people what God's love is all about. And we get so caught up in how to do things and the debates and the arguments and the snarky comments on Facebook that we have some ways defeated ourselves before we've even gotten started. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to open up to Galatians chapter 3. We're gonna see how they were facing some struggles that we faced here in the Bible Belt today. And I think we're gonna find some parallels for our own life. In Galatians chapter three, verse 26, Paul begins to confront religion and division inside the Christian church. He says, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, there's nothing wrong with being proud of your church. There's nothing wrong with being proud of your hobbies. There's nothing wrong with being proud of your family. But when being proud of the things that you're doing translate into superiority complex, that's when these things become problematic. A lot of counselors and therapists out there are getting a lot of business because of a phenomenon that's happening called mommy shaming. Because there's certain people out there on Facebook that can't brag about their style of parenting without tearing apart your style of parenting. And if you're a parent of toddlers like we are, it can be a little nerve wracking posting a picture because if you post a picture of your baby sleeping on, your, on her back, somebody thinks baby should sleep on their belly, thinks you're gonna kill your child that way and vice versa. Please do not post a picture of your baby drinking a bottle of formula because there's some people that think you should nurse your kids forever. You're danged if you do, danged if you don't. Here's how you know you're dealing with somebody that has a superiority complex. They can't compliment you without criticizing you in the same word. Oh my gosh, that shirt looks so much better than what you normally wear. (laughs) (laughs) Superiority complexes are problematic. 
Because what happens is we start thinking because my way is a better way, I must be a better person. Now I'm gonna, in full disclosure, I brought some, some illustration material here, coffee to demonstrate. This is gonna be a little bit therapeutic for me. I have a superiority complex when it comes to coffee. Now I think our first ser- for guest services, I think they do amazing job serving coffee. I drink it all the time. It's, it's coffee from Land of a Thousand Hills. It benefits children in Rwanda. Like it's amazing. You, you're doing good by drinking it. But I really believe that I make one of the best cups of coffee in Forsyth County. And uh, I grind my own beans. What I'm doing here is the AeroPress method. These are some, some beans that uh, were given to me for points by one of the tribes this weekend. What happens here, you gotta bring your hot water. It's kind of like an upside down French press. I don't know if you've ever had that before, but this is something where I really believe that this cup of coffee is elite. I don't think I'm better than you. I just think I drink better coffee than you do. <laughs> and I'm gonna enjoy a cup during the duration of this message. It's not fair that you guys get to drink coffee and I've gotta preach. So uh, I'm gonna make the perfect cup of black coffee. Now this takes a little bit longer than like the 20 second Keurig and I've got got no judgment against that, but this will change your life. You don't need to add cream or sugar to this. This is black coffee. I've never had somebody taste one of my cups of black coffee and say, oh, that was gross. They start getting curious about maybe if they should convert and become one of the black coffee drinkers. And if you don't believe me, I'll leave a little bit left over in this Mountain Lake mug that Pastor Chris got, the staff members. And I'm immune. I've already had every sickness this spring is going around. We went to Disney World a few weeks ago and every single one of my family members got a stomach virus and we were in the hotel the entire time. So I won't get you sick because I've already had it, but I guarantee you this will be one of the best cups of coffee you have ever drank. Black coffee is the only way to drink black coffee. Oh man, that is perfect. There's so many good things that are happening. You taste like a little bit of a a nutty, floral, caramel taste. Now you're probably thinking here, this dude is so arrogant. And I promise you, what I'm trying to do is work through this superiority complex. I don't think I'm anything special. I think my coffee is amazing. But if I'm not careful in the way I talk about coffee, I can come across as very judgmental, very condescending. And I think that happens a lot of times inside of the church when we think we've got it figured out. And we start holding our religion and our beliefs and our way of life as something to achieve and something to aspire to and something to accomplish. And sometimes we treat reading through different books of the Bible like some coffee taster. Mmm, Galatians. Mmm, I'm like a sommelier of theology here. Like, that's not what this is supposed to be. And this is the problem that was happening inside the early church there. You had two groups of believers that Paul is writing to, and he referenced them here when he said there's neither Jew nor Greek. Other translations may use the word Gentile, and Gentile is anybody who's not a Jew. So in this church, you had Jewish people who had grown up with the Old Testament, knew about Moses and all these old Hebrew kings, and they had hundreds of laws ceremonial, civil, and legal laws that they had to live up to, like not eating pork, which I couldn't do that. I love barbecue, so so pig is like the perfect animal. You get bacon, you get pork chops, you get ribs. I mean, it's it's amazing. And and the Jews were trying to tell the Israelites, you can't eat that, you can't do these things. If you wanna be a good Christian, you have to do it this way. Their religion was creating division, was creating an elite religious level of Christian, and then the unqualified, rough around the edges, unexperienced, recovering pagan Christians. And a lot of us probably identify more with the people who don't really know where to find something in the Bible without looking in the table of contents. When the pastor says a book in the Bible, you wanna know a page number, that's okay. If you don't know a lot about this, you're in the right place. You're in the company of a lot of imperfect people. And we're not coming to this because we've got it figured out. We're not coming to church to impress God. We come because we need it. We don't think we're better as Christians. We think Jesus is better. And all our goal is, is to try to take the attention off of us and show this world how amazing Jesus is, but knowledge puffs up, love builds up. And for some reason, there's this gravitational pull that the deeper we go in our faith, the easier it is to have spiritual arrogance. And where there's religion, there's always division. 
And so what Paul gives us is kind of a step-by-step playbook of how to find freedom from religion and then freedom from division. Man, we are arguing about so much in our nation right now. It's hard to get on Facebook without just having your blood pressure rise because of all the snarky comments. Most people start conversations not to learn and understand something new, but try to prove to you how wrong you are. And we are just as guilty, Christians. The very fact that there are so many denominations and arguments over things that don't really matter shows that this is something that is very relevant and pertinent to us as believers today. And if you don't believe the way you do, one of our goals at Mountain Lake is to be a church that doesn't play the blame game and doesn't try to fix everything. All we wanna do is is point people to Jesus and say, I was lost, then God, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. We're not coming to you. We're not bringing you to this church to look at us as some trophy case of believers. We just wanna make much of Jesus because all he has done for us. And if we can understand that, then we can really experience freedom from division and freedom from religion. So there's a couple of key words that I want us to dissect just for a few minutes together that I think will help us be able to experience freedom. There's one key word that sparks a lot of debate. And that word is son. You are all sons of God. Now get this, there are people that call themselves progressive that will try to tell you that the rhetoric of the New Testament is part of an archaic way of living that's designed to oppress women. Reality cannot be further from the truth. Jesus, growing up in a world that kept women in the kitchen, raising kids that didn't educate women, treated women with dignity, respect, and leadership. The very first people that Jesus revealed himself to after rising from the dead to begin spreading the good news was not his 12 disciples, it was women because he knew they were gonna get their butts in motion. All over the New Testament letters to these churches that were getting planted, you see that these churches were being opened up in the home of women and Paul was describing the leadership and the honor that these women deserved by being a part of these house churches. This word, becoming a son of God, has nothing to do with men and women. This word in the Greek, which is the original language this was written in, has more to do with a child that's adopted becoming more like the parents, the likeness of the father being transfused, being imputed onto an adopted child. I have a baby boy and a baby girl. The, the, the boy is like identical to me with looks like my toddler pictures look exactly like him. The likeness of me is clearly in him. But my baby girl, I'm hoping for her sake that she doesn't get this. <laughs> now, somehow I've been able to convince my wife to, to stay in love with me all these seven years. I think she has a vision problem. Don't pray for her, to, for her blindness to go away because if she sees who she's married to, I don't know what I'd do without her, but I'm praying my baby girl Adelaide gets her good looks, but I'm hoping that God has transformed me and is molding me into a man where maybe there's some good characteristics of me that she inherits as well. Let's just hope they're internal, not external. Let's hope that she looks like her mama, but maybe has a couple of qualities of her father. That's what it means to become a son of God. Also, Paul is proving a point because the word here for son that he was using was trying to illustrate what happens when a son gets adopted into a family where there's no biological son. You see, whether the the biological son was born, born first or fourth, Parents back in these days were looking for a firstborn son to be the leader of the siblings and to receive preferential treatment, to be able to maintain the family business and receive like a double share in the estate and the inheritance. And so let's just say you've got a family that has four girls and no boy. That mother and father are thinking, I love my girls, but I gotta have a boy. So they begin looking. Maybe it's a nephew, maybe it's a servant, maybe it was even a slave back then, but they would try to adopt a boy to become the leader of their children. And what Paul was saying here is that's who 
we are as Christ followers. We are adopted and now, regardless of our background, he says, whether you're Jewish, whether you're Greek, whether you're a slave, whether you're free, whether you're a man or a woman, none of the labels matter because if you receive Jesus and become a child of God, you now have the same status as a firstborn son. You receive preferential treatment. You become God's favorite child. And that's what it means to have the status of a son of God. But religion teaches something different. Religion teaches you gotta work, you gotta impress, you gotta earn, you gotta be good enough to keep it. And that's why religion is so dangerous. See, children of religion have to achieve status. Children of God receive their status. See, if we could be good enough to achieve it, that means we also have to be good enough to maintain it, which also implies that we could be bad enough to lose it. And the status of being a child of God, one of his favorite kids, is something we receive by his grace through faith. It's not an action, it's not a Sunday school attendance, there's not a quota of Bible verses we've got to memorize. It's not the absence of PG-13 movies in our lives. It's not refraining from secular music. See, religion says you got to do all these things to please God. And hopefully you'll be good enough to achieve the status. As a child of God, we just sit back and receive God's love. But it doesn't stop there. He talks about being baptized and, and using this word, he actually says, you put on Christ. Now here's what that means. This wedding ring right here, it symbolizes a commitment that I made to my wife, that I'm hers forevermore. When I take the ring off, it does not make me a single man. I would love to tell you that the only time I ever take this wedding ring off is I'm doing something awesome and manly like working on a car engine, but I don't know how to do anything on a car. I don't even change my own oil. So the only time I take my wedding ring off is that there's some really goopy hair, hair gel that I don't want to like get stuck in between. So, but you know what? I, don't you judge me. I want to see a bunch of men in here drink black coffee, a bunch of y'all putting sugar and cream in there. Bring it on, bro. Mmm, I'm a man. So here's the deal. This wedding ring is not what makes me married. Putting on this wedding ring is a symbol of who I belong to and who I've committed my life to. That's what it means to be a Christ follower and get baptized. If you've named Jesus the Lord, the leader, the forgiver of your life, you might have participated in something called believer's baptism where we dunk you underneath the water and we rise you back up. There's symbolism in that moment the same way there's symbolism in this wedding ring. Baptism doesn't forgive you of your sins. Receiving Jesus' forgiveness and saying yes to him is what changes us. Baptism is just a symbol of that life change. It symbolizes the old self being crucified with Christ, being dunked under the water, and then when the new you comes up out of the water, it's a symbolism of the new identity we have as a son of God, as a child of God, as God's favorite kid. So what he's saying is, would you put on Christ? You have something in common with other people who put on Christ. We share a common bond that goes deeper than even our blood relations and while you may have all kinds of different backgrounds and you may come from different parts of the country does it matter what college team you pull for doesn't matter if you're from the north or the south doesn't matter if you're black or white when you see somebody who puts on Christ you know we have something in common that is greater than any of our differences see the students this weekend are wearing this Illuminate Winter Retreat shirt. <laughs> and when they see one of their friends wearing that at school over the course of the week, they're gonna be reminded, oh yeah, you were there when those kids stuck their hand up in the air to say they're gonna trust in Jesus. We experience life change together. Man, think about the people who serve us as, as, as soldiers in the military or, or public servants as first responders or police officers, when they wear this uniform, skin color ceases to matter. 
how much money is in the bank account ceases to matter. They would take a bullet from one another because when they put on that uniform, they have more that makes them alike than what makes them different. That is supposed to be what happens in the family of God, regardless of our background, regardless of the stereotypes and the labels that our society tries to limit you with, despite the bad habits that you're dealing with, despite the mistakes, despite the victim mentality that we take. We, if we have put on Christ, have more that unifies us than what drives us apart. And we're living in a world that tries to tell you the key to having a unified society is tolerance. And that, that makes me so mad because tolerance is the lowest form of love to somebody who is different than you. I will tolerate you if you have a different skin color. I will tolerate you if you like traditional worship over new contemporary worship. I will tolerate you if you are a Georgia Tech fan. I will tolerate you if you have a different opinion than me politically. That doesn't say anything. God's people are supposed to not only notice what makes us different, but embrace and celebrate what makes us different because in Jesus, we have more that makes us alike. We are called to be the agent of change and unify this world and reconcile this world because something happens in the family of God. Our differences diminish in Jesus. What separates us, what divides us begins to matter a little bit less because we realize as sons and daughters and brothers and sisters, we've got people that should have our back. We should be the most unified people. But I wanna explain to you, there's a difference between unity and unison. I studied music growing up. Unison is when every part of the band, the orchestra, the choir, when they're all singing the same note, even though there's tenors and baritones and sopranos and altos and tubas and violins, unison is when they all are forced to play the same part. And it can be pretty, I'm actually gonna bring Sean out to help me kind of demonstrate this. Sean's a little bit more musical than I am. He is this just gifted worship leader. He's gonna give us a little bit of a key. Why don't you give us the key of, of F? Sean and I are gonna do a little throwback to an old hymn. We're gonna sing a little unison line for you. And then we're gonna show you how it changes when we begin to harmonize. We got F there. So you, can, you may know this song on Christ's Solid Rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Not bad, not bad, you get it, but wait. As much as we have alike, I know a lot of people mistake us for twins all the time. I mean, <laughs> he's my brother. When we begin to play our different parts, but still sing the same song, something beautiful happens. We're unified by our harmony. Let's go into some parts. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Give it up for Sean. See, same part. When we sing the same part, we're trying to fit something that maybe our voice wasn't made for, but when we sing different parts of the same song, we demonstrate unity despite diversity. That's what's supposed to happen in the family of God. In the family of God, socioeconomic, socioeconomic class ceases to matter. Race ceases to matter. Your mistakes no longer define you. The only label that matters in the family of God is Jesus, and in Jesus, our differences not only diminish, but what we have in common begins to swell. What we have in common begins to matter more. And we start realizing, because of the way Jesus loves me, it changes the way I treat other people because I didn't earn his love, so who am I to make anybody else earn my love or earn my approval? You see on crazy shows like 
Jerry Springer or Maury when they have this DNA test to determine who the father is. And most of the time, the father's trying to be like, no, that's not my kid. But that's not the case with our heavenly father. He wants so badly for the DNA test to show that we do belong to him, that we are a part of his family. And I wanna give you the DNA test to know if we really have received this status of the son of God. It's simple. See, love for Jesus is demonstrated by love for people. People that look alike, people that don't look alike people that maybe dress and listen to the same music that I do and people that don't. People outside of my political opinions, people that are. Love for Jesus is demonstrated by love for people. No strings attached. Loving people that we have no benefit to love, that we don't get anything back in return other than pointing them to Jesus and maybe being up with them on that big cracker barrel front porch in the sky of heaven one day. And they come to us and say, the way you love me made me realize Jesus is real. The way you love with no agenda, the way you loved and expected nothing in return, that showed me who Jesus is. <laughs> Our our student ministry on these camps and these retreats gets divided up into four tribes and they're competing for points all the weekend and they're thinking it's about one-upping the other tribe. And what we started doing is awarding points for the way they honor the other tribes and they honor the leaders and the way the high schoolers honor the middle schoolers. And so what's been happening is they've been coming together. The Bible says in Romans 12, 10 to outdo one another in showing honor. So you've got an orange tribe for Blaze, a, a blue tribe for Royals, a silver tribe for Titanium and a white tribe for Omni and they've all got these colors and these pride and they're all about winning these points. But what's been happening is they've been trying to take care of each other's trash this weekend. They've been trying to serve one another. They've, one of the tribes drove around to all the host homes last night and left goodie bags on the front porch. And we've been competing with all these points. And I just wanna show you something that happened to me because I told the tribes that Saturday night, whichever tribe has the most points, we're gonna bring a hairstylist on stage and they're gonna trim the initials of that tribe into my hair. And we had tribes that had the same points. We had a tie, so I had to deal with this. <laughs> Titanium and Royals, the T and the R, but I just think that was so cool because they stopped just fighting for themselves and they started fighting for one another despite their differences, despite their agendas, despite their goals. These students have come together to love one another. Our love for Jesus is demonstrated by our love for people. Yes, we should go on mission trips and try to reach this world. Yes, we should spend time in the word. Yes, we should try to be moral, upright people, but ultimately that's not what demonstrates who Jesus is. He said at the Last Supper that the way you will be identified as my children is the way you love one another. Yeah, we wanna love the outside world, but if we can't get it right here, we've lost before we've even started. So in a minute, the band's gonna come on. We're gonna sing one last song together before we get out of here. And this song is just all about the name of Jesus. And I want you to start looking around the room while you sing the song and realizing we're all so different. And that's what makes the body of Christ so beautiful. There's hands, there's feet, there's eyes, there's legs. Same song, different parts. We are not trying to be the same unison part. You have a unique role to play in this family. What I'm gonna challenge you to be thinking of during this next song, because of who Jesus is and what has he done for me, how can I show that love to my brothers and my sisters? Would you stand as the, the band leads us in this last moment of praise? <laughs>